You're listening to Balanced Alignment, Ayurveda Today, where we delve into the core of today's health and wellness landscape through the lens of Ayurveda, an ancient Indian science of medicine. This beautiful science is natural, holistic, and places the emphasis on enhancing our vitality today. Our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Swadastya swastya rakshanam, aturasya vikara prashamanam. To maintain the health and longevity of the healthy and to cure the sick. These are the fundamental aims of Ayurveda, and balanced alignment was created to manifest these aims. Welcome to the show. Hello, friends. I am here today with Kevin May. Kevin is an author, personal development coach, workshop facilitator, and musician from Pittsburgh. He is the founder of Healing is Cool and loves to assist in both personal and collective transformation through music, writing, and events. Books that he has authored are Unlocking Our Superpowers, Journey of Awakening, and The Joke Revolution. I had the pleasure of meeting Kevin at a yoga festival in Floyd. Is that West Virginia? Just regular Virginia. Okay, just regular Virginia. So <laughs> I met this guy at a yoga festival and he was giving away free uh, head, what do you head call massage. it? Nest massages. And so he I had was, me feeling I like a million giving... bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah some there some it is right this. there. Some of this. He had me feeling like a million bucks in about 10 seconds. And yeah. uh, from, from then on, the vibes kept flowing. So I got to spend some time with Kevin. Uh, we got to share in some musical exchanges, some uh, inner, some freestyle written word exchanges, and it was a blast. So welcome, Kevin. I'm really glad you're here. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm excited to dive in and yeah, that was a phenomenal festival, and I was just super thankful to co-create music with you and so many other magical beings. You know, we had some pretty epic freestyles there at the, the Mandala Chocolate Habibi Village Convergence booth. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so I am pretty interested in your book, Unlocking Our Superpowers. So yeah. my assumption is that because generally most people experience something and then they write a book about it. Is yeah. that true with you? I would say definitely yes. Uh, I, I chose the name Unlocking Our Superpowers rather than Unlock Your Superpowers so that people would be saying an affirmation as they say the title of the book. You know, it's like it's it's an active in motion um you know, active verb, unlocking our superpowers, because I have the book right here. And uh, it's the subtitle is a handbook for personal and collective transformation. So it's not only about personal empowerment, but it's about community empowerment. And a huge part of my journey has been uh, creating and facilitating community events. Here in Pittsburgh, I started uh, an event with some friends way back in 2011, which is actually on the front of the cover. It's a big circle of people holding hands, which, you know, the average person might say like, oh, that's just a bunch of hippies singing Kumbaya. But um, it was really a profound event. This was our very first event back in 2011. And to this day, it's actually been our largest circle because we were so hyped about it and we pushed it so hard that we ended up manifesting like 300 people throughout the day. And um, we've done it every year since, except during COVID. Um, but it's really been about bringing people from all different backgrounds together and saying, everybody has a puzzle piece. Everybody has a superpower to contribute towards the whole. And how can we weave this community back together? Because I believe one of the biggest problems in society is we're so boxed in. Everyone's 
living in their own little consumerist lifestyle, just trying to pay their bills. And we need to reweave community back together. And I feel like when we come together as community, we can share our gifts, which I say a superpower is any talent or gift that you claim as a superpower. So it could be anything as simple as giving good hugs, cooking good gluten-free cookies, you know, whatever you want it to be. If you claim it as a superpower, then you're like, yeah, I own this. This is my, this is my thing. And so, yeah, I've definitely been honing my own superpowers. I would say you got to experience one of them at Floyd Yoga Jam, which is facilitating song and freestyle circles. Um, but really, this book is like an encyclopedia for people to tune into what they're feeling drawn to because it covers quite a lot of different topics and then really focus their energy into that area, whether it's improving their diet or whether it's learning to uh, organize community events. There's a whole chapter in there sharing like the coolest things that I've learned of 14 years of being a community organizer. So, so yeah, it's really about unlocking our personal superpowers as well as activating our community, you know, level as well. How did you first identify that I have superpowers? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a good question. I would say I always felt like a strange kid. Uh, running was probably my very first superpower that I was recognized for because as a little kid I was I was like the fastest kid on my soccer team and um, ended up doing track in fourth grade I won the city championships in the sprints um, which was pretty strange for a white kid I guess <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah so running was like the first superpower where I was like wow I'm actually really good at this and you know, faster than everybody else, at least at my school and stuff. Um, and then also, my dad has always been into kind of circus things like juggling unicycling. And so he actually taught me and my sister how to ride unicycles at eight years old. And so that set me apart from other people because I could ride a unicycle. And then at 10 years old, I learned how to juggle. And so we would perform in the talent shows at school and stuff. And everyone was like, oh, my God, Kevin May does that cool. You know, we, our group was called the Anti-Gravity Zone, which my dad came up with. Um, and so, yeah, we'd wear these tie-dyed shirts. And we just, everyone was always like, I mean, it's going to sound like I'm bragging. But they'd be like, oh, my God, that was the best act of the whole talent show. Because, like. A lot of people would just like sing or dance, which everyone's used to, but like we had all these crazy tricks and things we would pull out. And so I feel like having that as part of my childhood showed me that there was this, you know, unique talent within me. But I truly believe that we all have unique talents and abilities. And like Michelangelo says, the statue is already within the block. You just have to chisel away all of the excess and the stuff that's not necessary and you find that beautiful gift or gem at the at the center and i sincerely believe that we we all have a purpose within the ecosystem like nature always has a purpose for each part of the ecosystem and so you know i've been developing my own superpowers over the years and I also really love to just give other people encouragement because some people already have superpowers, but they don't share them or they're they're not putting in the effort to actually develop them. So, yeah, I hope that sort of answers your question. Mm -hmm. I like how you referred to nature there, that nature yeah. has a distinct purpose. Uh, for yeah. you, for me, for everybody. Uh, so I'm drawn to you for several reasons. Uh, one of the fun connections uh, between how you see things, how you experience things, and how Ayurveda, you know, shares, and, and my understanding of Ayurveda is this uh, the superpower idea. For one, you know, mm -hmm. according to Ayurveda, your nature, 
is your individual constitution. It is you are you. You are the only you that has ever been you and no other you will ever exist. And so yeah. with that comes superpowers. Mm -hmm. And so that constitution, we talk about it in terms of the doshas, the biological energetic categories of the body, uh, and that those have both benefits and susceptibilities. For example, a person who has is strong and has good stamina and a strong energy reservoir, and they're typically heavier people. So those are natural superpowers. At the same time, the natural susceptibility when they get stressed is, well, I feel heavy, right? They, they feel heavy. They're much more likely to tilt towards heaviness, lethargy, excess sleep than they are towards, say, anxiety uh, or losing weight or anger or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. We all have our kryptonite, you know, that kind of balances with our superpowers. I've been having this big issue with my foot. Um, and yeah, it's like, I feel like it would be boring, though, if we were just all superpowers, you know, like you have to have some stuff to keep you uh, keep you grounded. And um, but but yeah, so I really do think we all have we all have great abilities, but that's why we need community because we kind of fill in the gaps of this person has this shortcoming, so we're gonna help fill in over here, you know. And I like to say one plus one equals eleven when we come mm. together in community. It just it it amplifies exponentially. Indeed. I strongly resonate with that message as well. Uh, in, in considering the question, why does alternative medicine lag behind conventional medicine? It's occurred to me that, to be totally honest, I believe that the market demand for alternative natural holistic medicine is equivalent, if not higher, than it is for conventional medicine. The main difference is organization. There's a structured institution with conventional medicine and with alternative holistic medicine, we're all in our little silos. Like you said, everybody's got their own little business. Everybody's got their own little LLC, which is great and phenomenal. And at the same time, we lose the benefits of that cohesive institution. Hmm. Yeah, that is an interesting point. And one thought that sort of relates to that is that I saw this meme because everyone knows memes is the great greatest way to get your news uh <laughs> it said why is it called alternative medicine when these are the things that have been used for 99 percent of humanity <laughs> and it's oh, only yeah. in the past little tiny microscopic fraction of humanity that we started taking all these things that are synthesized in a laboratory and x y and z and so just having that mental flip, I mean, it's similar to you go to the the mainstream grocery store and there's a section called health foods. This is the health food section. So then uh, what is everything else in the store? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so so, yeah, I think that, you know, that's part of why I chose this motto for my company of healing is cool, because I really want to just make these powerful modalities and options the cool thing to do and just more normalized you know it's like oh it's a saturday night there's literally infinite possibilities of what we could do we could do what we've been programmed to do which is go drink a couple beers at a bar or we could do 700 other activities go to a sound bath have a freestyle jam you know, hike up a mountain, whatever, focus on building your business. Like there's literally infinite other options. And so part of the message with healing is cool is just like encouraging people like, yo, you don't have to do the mainstream strange dream in order to be cool. There's a lot of other beautiful alternatives that in my personal opinion, feel so much better than the mainstream strange dream. It's like, one of my big spiels is like, hey, guys, just do an honest experiment, like go to a bar, 
two nights in a row on a weekend and see how you feel on Monday and then uh, do a yoga festival on Friday, Saturday and see how you feel on Monday and just like be honest with yourself like, oh, yeah, this is the difference. And so my conviction is that love feels better than fear and health feels better than feeling miserable. <laughs> and so why not just, you know, do some experiments? I'm big on encouraging people to do experiments and say, I'm going to eat, you know, clean for a week and see how I feel. And then I'm going to eat potato chips every, you know, a whole bag of potato chips every night and see how I feel. So anywho, that's one of, I have a lot of spiels that I like to share because I'm passionate about a lot of different issues and food is definitely high on the list. Um, one of my recent like semi-viral Instagram videos is me in the hospital showing they're, they're selling Mountain Dew in hospital uh, cafes and then they got fresh donuts there and then they got Doritos and it's like, how could these people not get the memo? Like 70, a uh, one Mountain Dew bottle has 77 grams of sugar. That's like how much sugar I eat an entire week or so. <laughs> like, it's really absurd. What's what the, I, I keep calling it the mainstream strange dream to just kind of remind people that just because we've been conditioned since birth, that this is normal. This is regular it's not fucking normal. Like this is all brand new to the human species in the last, you know, really 70 years since oil really came online in the fifties and all these plastics and, you know, super artificial ultra processed foods came into existence. Like all the stuff that we've been programmed that is normal is not fucking normal. It's not normal to, put 77 grams of high fructose corn syrup in your body at lunch, especially if you're trying to heal at a hospital. So anyway, that's my, that's another spiel for me. Amen. You're in good company. And I like that you're pointing that out because you're very right. Yeah. You know, what is, what is normal within our lifetime is not the norm across the human timeline. That, that, that just happened. These changes just occurred. All yeah. the synthetic drugs, all the severe surgeries, you know, I mean, doctors just love taking out organs now. They're like, oh, gallbladder, you don't need it. Yeah. And it's just like, maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> but a as an individual, you know, it, it, it benefits us to consider, well, maybe I do need that. You know, maybe before having a surgery, maybe before hopping onto a pharmaceutical synthetic drug, which is toxic by nature. Yeah. There, there is no pharmaceutical that is not toxic to your body. I mean, they are synthetic. Synthetic means unnatural. Unnatural means unedible. Like it's not biologically attuned to your system. So any mm -hmm. prescription drug that you take, it is synthetic. It, it is toxic to some mm -hmm. degree. It's just a question of how much and how well you can deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Mainstream strange dream. You're right. It's it is strange. Uh, if we could, you know, transport ourselves, or or if we could somehow in, put this reality into the vision or experience of a human being a hundred years ago, two hundred, three hundred years ago, it it would be a strange dream indeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, just jumping off one point you made there, um, this is a glimpse at my new book, which is actually about to come out next month called state of being, which is essentially the sequel to unlock your superpowers. And there's a whole chapter in here about healing chronic pain, which has been a huge part of my journey as well. And I've been really doing a lot of research and studying doctors that claim to have solutions to chronic pain and one of them is dr howard schubiner have you ever heard of him i have not he's really he's really doing some cutting edge stuff and he has done he's done a lot of research and and showed how there's a lot of studies that show that doctors will 
do do scans on one group of people and scans on another group of people and one group will be uh prescribed surgeries essentially when they don't actually need surgeries because the pain is actually more of a psychosomatic thing essentially so the the gist of the the whole spiel is that our emotions play a huge role into our our chronic pain um you know our diet things like this but then doctors as you said they they just want to do a surgery let's jump right into that you know $12,000 back surgery when the issue that might not actually be the real issue and a lot of times people do get surgeries and then the pain comes back right after because there's there's a psychological component or there's an emotional component or there's a, a, a habit component. If people are eating constant inflammatory foods and maybe they, you know, have mold in their home or these other factors. So in my book, I have kind of like a checklist, like if you're in pain, first look into these things, because before you get that $12,000 surgery, it's worth it to try putting your feet on the earth every morning and every night to discharge all of those non-native EMFs. For example, that's one big thing that I advocate everyone do is to reconnect to the living earth that we literally are earthlings. So wouldn't it make sense to, to connect to that healing energy that the earth is always, you know, blasting freely towards us. So anyway, this is just kind of jumping off that point of like doctors just taking out your spleen. They might also want to do a back surgery when you don't actually need that. And I'm not trying to hate on doctors. I know a lot of doctors have great intentions, but in a system where profit is the number one goal, I feel like that's an inherent flaw in a healthcare system when when profit is more important than the real well-being of of humans so well you know what's interesting is that it's it's profit incentivized by what because apple is driven by profit we love iphones amazon mm -hmm. is driven by profit these are incredible companies that create incredible value for human beings mm -hmm. so what's the difference well i would say that those are examples of how I'm not saying that having a an incentive for innovation is a bad thing. Capitalism in its current form incentivizes innovation, but a side effect, so that's good, but the side effect is that if a company can make 12 cents profit by giving you toxins in your soda, or they can make 11 cents profit for not putting toxins in your soda, they're incentivized to do the the 12 cents profit and put toxins in your soda because that supports their bottom line, et, et cetera. So I think there needs to be more of a holistic framework for how corporations need to run. You know, there's the thing of the B corporation, uh, which is like, you know, people planet profit or something that helps get a more holistic sense. But I really do believe that we're going to need to reform our economy in some fashion if we're going to preserve this planet because um, I think that the current structure of the economy is is incentivizing people to just destroy the earth and at, at an insane speed. Um, so I guess that sort of answers your question, but yeah. It's a topic that we could go down. And yeah. we won't spend too much time going down it. Okay. I will add. That I think one of the biggest differences is incentivized by whom. Mm -hmm. So Apple is incentivized by you and I, by individuals. If we buy their iPhone, good for them. But we have other options. We could buy an Android. We could buy a Google Pixel. And so we get to choose. The difference with the healthcare system, the reason why good people are going into medicine and burning out instantly 
because the system that they're in isn't working is because we are not the consumers of the healthcare system. Generally speaking, the healthcare system is paid by the government, is paid by big pharmaceutical companies. They're paid by other institutions, and, and mm -hmm. we are the pawns underneath. We are not the direct clients. Yeah. So that, that's what poisons the system. And to be honest, that's also the case with Mountain Dew. Mountain mm -hmm. Dew, McDonald's, they get huge subsidies from the government. Yeah. What's up with that? Why can't we subsidize bicycles and cacao, you know? <laughs> you know, to be totally honest, I actually, when I find out that the government was subsidizing processed food in a major way, that a $5 Big Mac is actually supposed to cost $13 without mm -hmm. government subsidies, mm -hmm. I began to cry. Yeah. And, and, and it was because I, I had... I had been recently learning essentially how much support the, I'm just going to call it broken healthcare system receives from the government, how much they're funneling into and supporting that and keeping that afloat and making people sick. Uh, and then when I learned that they're also funding the cause, it just, I, I just began to cry. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I really think that there's a there's a wonderful elder activist named Joanna Macy. She has a famous book called The Work That Reconnects. And she's really big on writing about and also creating workshops where people can really feel the depth of their emotions related to a lot of these things because I feel like a lot of times there's not the proper space for people to feel like the magnitude of how fucked up that is you know like the level of anger the level of sadness the level of like hopelessness sometimes that people feel and so I really do think that it's important for us who do care to any degree to like really tune in to what deep emotions we have and hopefully create a space within with yourself or with a community that you can allow those feelings to come through and actually like shed those tears you know i've i've cried on numerous documentaries that i've watched of just like holy shit like what are we doing here like it's crazy i mean one of the first ones was learning about the genocide in darfur back in 2008 and like I watched this documentary and it was like it wasn't even showing on the news. Everyone was freaking out about like the Michael Jackson trial. And it's like that's one thing that like just is like a mind explosion for me of just like how profoundly distracted most people are and how we have all these things that just like it's like this hamster wheel of like, well, as long as you got the next holiday to think about the next football game to think about the next thing you don't have time to like really feel your deep emotions and feel like the fullness of life and i feel like that's a huge problem and i have this poem that's called leaving the stampede which is like encouraging people to just jump out of that stampede even if it's for a day even if it's for two hours because everyone's just moving at this unnatural pace as well i feel like our society in general is just like rush 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 do this thing faster better stronger faster it's like where where are we going what are we doing i mean america's like every so the the statistics on you know chronic sickness across the country are increasing on almost every possible level so it's like what the fuck are we doing like excuse my language but it's like um it's really quite insane so much of this stuff and the magnitude of it it just causes all sorts of emotions to flow and i i really honor you for letting yourself feel that emotion and you know encourage other people to try to actually allow that to flow through because tying back to joanna macy she talks about how allowing that energy to flow actually frees up ability to take action so once you 
get your anger out it's like now you're not holding that energy back anymore you've allowed it to flow through you and now you have much more ability to take action and that's that's been continuously shown to me over my 16 years of really being on this journey is the importance of feeling my own emotions letting them through and then I have so much more ability to actually take action in the world. And that's exactly it. Uh, I don't believe that waiting for society or waiting for the government to change is a good idea. Uh, our only option is to do it ourselves. I love that step out of the stampede because uh, that's an individual choice, right? We can do that ourselves. I can do that myself. I can decide. I'm going to do that today. I'm going to do that at six o'clock. I can choose that. And that that individual choice, I think, is the most powerful thing we can do. Uh, and I also think that illuminates why the work of building a community uh, and organizing ourselves together is so important, because as human beings, we crave that community. And so there is a loss from stepping out of that stampede, even if it is a crazy, wild, strange dream stampede. It's the stampede that we grew up with. And it's what we're used to. And so to step out into nothingness is it has its benefits, although to step out into a different community of, of people that are you know, wanting what we want, um, prioritizing what we prioritize, valuing the simple good air, good food, good water, good community um, type things. I mean, that is that's it. I, I think that's I think that's why we're here. I, I think that work unifies us. Absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of people start to feel like they might be going crazy when they unplug from the stampede or unplug from the matrix. And a lot of people go through what's called a dark night of the soul, which often doesn't just last one night, it could last weeks, months, even years, potentially. And I do believe that it will end. And it's important, as you said, to seek out like-minded people, to, to build connections with other people, because I've been a community organizer here in Pittsburgh for many years, and all the time I'll meet people out in public, maybe they'll see my shirt and we'll start talking or whatever sparks a conversation, and they think they're the only one that's into any of this. So I'm like, yo, you got to start coming to some of these events, come to ecstatic dance, come to a song circle. And, um, yeah, I, I feel called to share this, this, um, uh, little download, which I got from a friend and mentor named Charles Eisenstein. Have you heard of him? I have not. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's a great speaker about a lot of these topics that we're exploring here. And I will highly recommend his essay called the invisible path because, he talks about how if you're going to stray from the mainstream, your path then becomes invisible and you have to follow these different things like your instincts, your, your intuition, synchronicities in order to find that invisible path of your own soul calling. So that's a great essay. In addition to that, Charles Eisenstein talks about how many people discuss, oh, we're moving into a new age or we're moving into the new earth, which I do feel is true in many ways. I mean, so many things are completely new. As we were talking about 100 years ago, all, all this stuff would just seem crazy. And with that said, it's not just new. We're actually resuming ancient ways of being and ancient values and so he calls it the new and ancient story uh, that we're learning to embody more and more every day. And so I like to remind everyone that we're all storytellers. Literally, in any moment, you can choose to tell a different story about your life. You can look back on your past and rather than uh, feeling like a victim, regardless of how intense things you went through, you can use it all as lessons and fuel to find your calling moving forward. You know, if something really horrible happened to you, perhaps you could weave that into your calling moving forward. And so 
this new and ancient story, we're learning to not just be storytellers and tell the story of our personal journey and the, the world that we're creating, but we're also story weavers and we're weaving it into existence through our actions, through our food, through our, you know, dance moves, all these different things. And so we're weaving this new and ancient story into existence through conversations like this, you know, through yoga festivals. And it's really just incredibly beautiful when you take a moment and look and look at it, how many people are actively creating their own story and, and working to embody both a new and an ancient way of being on planet Earth. That's true. Yeah, it's like carving out a new, what would you call it? It's, it's just carving out a new way of being. Yeah. That's how I think of it. Amidst... Creating, creating new neural, neural pathways in the brain as well. So I'm curious about your writing. I'd like to know how writing a book impacted your superpowers. Well, uh, my very first book was The Journey of Awakening, um, which originally was published in 2012. And uh, that was very profound because I had it as a vision for about two years and then to fully bring it to fruition and be able to share it with people and see that them light up and their reactions. It just was kind of, it was very affirming to me. And I would say that it, it boosted my confidence in my ability to turn an idea into reality. And um, some people might know the famous influencer named Alex Hormozzi. And he, uh, he says, I'll do my best to paraphrase this quote. He says, you don't build confidence by shouting affirmations at the mirror. You build confidence by having a stack of evidence and proof that you do what you say you do. And so I'm actually a huge fan of affirmations. I think we need both because I, I say an affirmation is literally just an intentionally chosen thought or word. And so we're literally saying 60,000 affirmations per day. It's just a matter of how much intention you're putting behind them. So side note on that. But um, yeah, so writing writing my first book was like a boost to my confidence. It's like, yeah, I, I did what I set out to do. And now it's making a positive impact in the world. And that that first book was a poetry book, which was, you know, a relatively small project. But my second book, Unlocking Our Superpowers, was like a gargantuan project. This this is like kind of 20 books condensed into one, but it felt like it was kind of a homework assignment from the universe. Um, I did quite a lot of, you know, non-ordinary experiences over the first eight years of my journey, which started when I was 17. And so I wanted to write a book that kind of compiled the most empowering things that had helped me on my journey and create like a handbook essentially. And, and so that's, that's been working its magic in the world for the last eight years. I published it in 2016 and it really is remarkable just how much positive feedback I've gotten. And so I don't claim to be perfect. I don't claim to have all the perfect answers, but a lot of what I aim to do with my books is give people tools and frameworks that can be applied in a lot of different areas and essentially just help people to self-reflect more. So there's a lot about asking good questions. So rather than saying, hey, everyone, this is the perfect diet. I, I found the answer to everything. Rather than saying something like that, it's like, look, here's 10 questions you can ask yourself to try to hone in on what foods are better for you. Uh, rather than just saying what foods give me pleasure, I have a concept called holistic pleasure. So 
analyzing the food before you even eat it. Does it smell good to me? Does it does it look good to me? Um, analyzing where it came from. Was it made with love, etc. These are like creating more of a holistic framework for your pleasure. And then and then in the present moment while you're eating it, um, try not to be distracted while you're eating your food so you can actually sense what information it's giving you. Is it actually, you know, benefiting you on a holistic level? And then how do you feel after you eat the food? How do you feel, you know, one hour after you eat the food? How do you feel the day after you eat the food? So having more of a holistic framework for food is a really for pleasure in particular is is one of the tools that I like to share with people. And so yeah, I'd say writing writing the books has been awesome because it's been able to genuinely help a lot of people and it's allowed me to get even more of a deeper understanding of these different tools and frameworks that have really benefited me. So you coach, what does a coaching session look like with you? Yes. Yeah, so it could look a number of different ways. Um, I sometimes just do a one, a one off session with somebody if there's a specific thing they're wanting to just kind of dive into. But I like to do eight week uh, containers where we meet five times within eight weeks. Um, and really, my main book, Unlocking Our Superpowers is kind of like the toolkit that can be applied on whatever somebody's you know focus area is so I've had people come to me for a lot of different things that they want support with um, I call myself a personal development coach because I really want people to just kind of grow into the next level of themselves and and embody that new story that they're stepping into um, so usually my sessions are 90 minutes and we'll start out with just a brief check-in and then I like to lead them through a guided meditation because as my new book is called State of Being, um, I think that it's really important to, to get centered and to get clear, allowing people to tap into their full, um, their full multidimensional self when they do that session so that they're not just coming off, you know, zillion other things and they're kind of distracted it's like they're really grounding into their most true self so that they can get clear so i i do my best to help them come to the answers within themselves and so i help do this guided meditation so they can get into alignment and then it's like the revelations the clarity on the next action steps happen a lot smoother that way so yeah we'll do a guided meditation and then depending on what the focus area is, I will usually uh, choose certain tools that they can implement in the session, and then have a homework assignment or two to do over the next week or until we meet next, um, so that they can have a clear direction of what action steps they want to work on. Beautiful. Okay. And how do people like connect with you if they want to do that? Well, I'd say messaging me on social media is a great way. Um, my email as well as is Kevin May coaching at Gmail. Um, I do have a little page on my main website that explains about coaching. Um, but generally, I just encourage people to, to reach out to me. Um, I, I'm just about finishing writing this book, which I've really been in kind of hunkered down mode. So normally I lead monthly online workshops with different themes of personal development, which allows people to kind of get a taste of my style of coaching. So I've led dozens of those over the past few years, but I've put those on hold for the last three months as I've just been finishing this book. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when those are going to resume because I'm actually going to do a song circle tour in December, which I'm stoked about. Mm. Um, but they will definitely resume at some point. But but yeah, I would encourage people to just send me a DM. I really love connecting with people. I don't like all this obsession with automation uh, per se because I just like genuinely connecting with people. 
and so yeah if anyone listening to this or watching this just say what's up you know beautiful yeah i'll definitely link that stuff in the description as well okay okay so i want you to leave us with some tips so for anybody who's like you know what that sounds good kevin i want to step out of the stampede i want to see what it feels like to step out what's what's first step I would say there's many, there's many first steps. I definitely recommend going to a festival that fits into the realm of transformational festival, which I would say is more geared towards personal growth rather than just an escape from reality. So there's usually more workshops. There's usually some degree of ceremony or ritual perhaps. Um, just to bring everyone together in that sense, rather than just like everyone's a consumer, get there, go to your camp, everyone's kind of separate. There's like, if the festival has an opening ceremony and a closing ceremony, then you're probably at a transformational festival. So that's where Daryl and I first met at such a festival called Floyd Yoga Jam. But there's literally festivals like this happening all over the country all the time. I mean, Maybe it's not popping off in Alabama per se, because I actually did try to find some stuff in Alabama for a friend and I couldn't find hardly anything. But again, if you're in like some random state and you want to send me a DM, I will literally, I I know people all over the world that are into this stuff. This has literally been my passion for 16 years. So if you send me a DM and you're like, hey, I'm in Fayetteville, Arkansas, within two minutes, I could have you linked to, to, the homies in in Fayetteville that are living the new and ancient story. So I would say a huge first recommendation is like, just gather all the confidence you can muster and go to some of these alternative events, you know, go, go find at least a yoga class, um, an ice bath group, something like that to just start getting yourself out of the, the mainstream strange dream, um, So that's one big first step. The second big step that I feel is just mandatory pretty much is put your feet in the grass every single day. I mean, if it's freezing cold out, maybe don't do it. But reconnecting to the earth, which has given us life, which we literally are beings of the earth, um, that is such a pivotal first step, in my opinion, that there's literally no excuse why you shouldn't do that unless you live in like the center of Brooklyn and there's zero parks whatsoever. But that is really one of my top things, helping people to reconnect because one of my core messages is that the root of all of our problems is separation, whether perceived or literal. We've become separate from nature we become separated from other people and community. And we've even become separated from ourselves and from our true core essence. And so if the problem is separation, and you could say we've been separated from the divine or the universe. So if the core problem is separation, then what would the solution be? You got any thoughts? I think it's connection, Kevin. I would say it's something in that realm. Yes. So reconnection is, is really the solution to so many of our problems, in my opinion. So how can you reconnect to nature? How can you reconnect to community? How can you reconnect with yourself? How can you reconnect with the universe? These are the big questions that I encourage everyone to explore. And there's millions of answers, but that's the fun of the journey is to, is to, is to go take action and explore these things. So I would say, yeah, another big recommendation is just take action. Stop overthinking everything. I mean, of course, do your research. Don't put yourself in some stupid situation, but taking action, experimenting, exploring, these are great steps to to get yourself out of the stampede a little bit i love it okay so take off my shoes go outside take an action find a yoga festival 
sign up for it and then find a yoga class or an ice bath, whatever I'm into and do that today or tomorrow. There you go. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Well, Kevin, thank you. Thank you. This has been a fantastic conversation and you've shared so much with us. Well, this is this is what I'm here for. I've survived three near death experiences. So, you know, I'm grateful to still be here. And maybe next podcast, we can explore some of those. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I'm I'm all in on the new and ancient story. And I'm super pumped for my new book, which comes out on 1111, which dives deeper into all of this beautiful topics. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hyped. Awesome. Cheers. Same to you, brother. Thank you.